Hi, we continue in Genesis 17 today as the conversation between God and Abraham turns to Sarah, uh, who is now renamed from Sarai to Sarah in these verses. It will also continue into what we hope uh, is an amusing aspect of this as they laugh at the possibility. First, Abraham here in chapter 18, Sarah will laugh, and then there'll be an amusing situation as we'll look at briefly here and more when we get to chapter 18 about God challenging Abraham about whether Sarah laughed or not. And so there'll be a lot of laughter in this scene. And as you may or may not know, at this point in our journey, the son born to them, Isaac, has the meaning laughter. So there'll be a lot of laughter at various levels that we'll look at. On the right side of the screen, you can see the various structures that we've been working with, noting that none of them are perfect, that both the chiastic structure and the parallel panels proposed by Wenham have verses missing. Here you see verse 8 missing, and here you see verse uh, 18 missing. But they provide a general shape to what we're about, and we're now on this section here, and we turn to the Sarah side of that. It perhaps is more clear from the paragraph arrangement I've arranged set up here for key words and themes. Uh, and as we switch to what we're looking at here, you'll notice that as each section had a specific key word, repeated last time we saw every male among you must be circumcised in a ritual repetition uh, and now here we see bear bear a child five times uh, in this section here and the only thing will be left is for Abraham to carry it out uh, as we'll see in our next video so let's jump right in here uh, notice that as God is speaking to Abraham Sarah is not there as far as we know this is God saying something to Abraham about Sarah but we don't know where Sarah is and in fact Sarah has no direct relationship with Yahweh or Elohim at all at this point but that will not be true in chapter 18, as we'll see. So as for Sarah, your wife, and that's following the kind of paragraphs of a, of a covenant contract sort of form that we've been seeing. So as for you, as for Sarah, your wife, as for Ishmael. So we'll see the provisions for each part. So as for Sarah, your woman, and noting again that there's no Hebrew for wife or, or husband. So Sarah, your woman, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Interestingly, in the, in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew, it has Sarai here. Um, not Sarah. So as for Sarah, your wife, you will not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name, which makes perfect sense that God wouldn't be saying calling her Sarah before the name is changed. So why the new RSV has it that way, I don't know. But there's an interesting implicit play on words here. Um, the word Sarah uh, means in its primary meaning princess. And we looked earlier at the struggle scene between Sarah and uh, Hagar around the question of status and pregnancy. Um, the issue of the Hieros Gamos, the uh, sacred, quote unquote, sacred marriage and empire back in Babylon that may have been the cause of her infertility. And if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go back uh, to some of those earlier videos. But the name princess was one implication that feminists biblical scholars have used to infer that possibility that she was held in the royal court in in Babylon uh, to be the symbolic wife of the gods and that would be why she wouldn't be pregnant and so at this point um, Yahweh or Elohim in this case the God of them the God of the Israelites so we'll see uh, is more powerful can break the imperial lock on her fertility and give her a son. So we'll see that uh, through this here. But the name Sarah also later can mean struggle. Let's look at that briefly here in 3228. So we can see the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you've striven with God. And the word for striven here, Saritha, is from the same root. And so there's an interesting link here between the name Sarah as princess and struggle with the anticipation of their descendants, Jacob, as one who struggles with God and struggles with others. And we'll look at it when we get to the Jacob story that that's not necessarily negative. And that can mean an intimacy of engagement uh, as well as uh, confrontation. But that's all for much later in chapter 32. So uh, we continue in verse 16 and notice this exact parallel with 17.6. We can see it up here. Um, so I will, without the blessing though, it's only Sarah who's said to be blessed here. Uh, and we'll look at that would mean in just a second. I will bless her and moreover, or and also, uh, unusual word here, I will give you a son by her. And notice that we've been looking, as we saw in verses 5, 6, and 8, around the language of the covenant, that the newer by standard often had, I will make the covenant. But we noted that the verb natan here was used often, uh, always in all these cases, for give. So God will give the covenant, God will give the land, God will give of many offspring, but more particularly, God will give you a son by her. And this is the promise that we've been hearing all along, but now it's going to be specific, as we'll see a little later in our passage. So we'll give you a son by her. Um, and as my note below says, up to this point, the promises in this scene to Abraham could be fulfilled through the 13-year-old Ishmael. And this comes as a big surprise, uh, although we'll see how Abraham responds to it in a minute. 
Uh, notice, I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Echoing what we saw in verse 6, but differently, as we'll see in just a minute. This section has a number of little ABA chiasms. Here's one. So you'll see, I will bless her twice. And in the middle is, I will give you a son by her. So little ABA chiasms. And there's several of those that we'll look at here. In contrast, what we saw in verse 6, where kings of people shall come out, um, or kings shall come out from Abraham. Here, it's um, not the verb uh, for come out, but the verb uh, to be in both here and there, in both cases. So um, nations will be from her, if you will, and kings will be from her. But unusual here is kings of peoples. Usually it's kings of nations, goyim. And so give rise to nations. In the verse 6 thing, it didn't specify kings of what. But kings of peoples is very unusual because the Hebrew word am and the plural here, amim, usually refers not to political entities, but to what we might call cultural or ethnic groups, but more specifically to Israel. Israel often is the contrast as the people of God in contrast with the Goyim, the others, the nations. And if you're familiar with Jewish language to this day, we might think about how Gentiles, which is Goyim via Latin, um, refers to everybody who's not a Jew. So this is interesting. Plural kings of peoples shall um, uh, come from her. And there's no reason to interpret that any differently than we did in the last video where I was highlighting that's a negative outcome, not a positive one. But what shifts here in verse 17 <clears throat> is, um, is surprising. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. <clears throat> and as the chiastic structure suggests, this is parallel here. Um, but the first one seemed pious, and this one plainly is not. Um, he laughed um, and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So finally, uh, the impossibility of this whole thing is coming out. Abraham is no longer just standing there taking it, but it's all coming out. Let's look more closely at the words blessing and laughter here to get a sense of how they fit into the bigger context. So these are a few examples of, of the Hebrew verb uh, barak here for blessing. Uh, I'll note that of the 72 uses, many of them are other characters invoking either divine blessing or some other blessing. For example, most famously in chapter 27 are Jacob and Esau uh, struggling to get the blessing from their father Isaac. But human blessing is not the same as divine blessing. And one of the things we'll look at when we get to chapter 27 is human blessing may have no power whatsoever, be nothing more than a pious wish, because it's God who has the power to make fertility and not humans. And as you can see, I hope from the chart on the right side here, these are just some examples, but they're consistent with others, and I just didn't want to burden it with too many, of the ways that it says God in particular is offering blessing, almost always connected, in fact, virtually always connected with fertility. Because that's what blessing is in the Bible from uh, chapter 1, be fruitful and multiply, and all the way through be fruitful and multiply. And I really want to highlight that against so-called prosperity churches suggesting that blessing is wealth. And that is simply not true here, although uh, Abraham's servant will interpret it that way. Way, um, when he goes back to the old country, he'll interpret Laban's wealth as blessing, uh, and Laban will interpret Abraham's wealth as blessing. That's the Mesopotamian viewpoint, but that's not the Genesis viewpoint. So with great irony, modern Christian prosperity gospel people are taking up the very perspective on blessing that the Hebrew Bible rejects, uh, that blessing means material wealth as opposed to fertility. Uh, and it's blessing not only the human womb and of the sperm that feed the womb with seed, but of the earth itself, as we saw in the garden story. Um, so um, blessing is fertility, and that's what's being offered here, that Sarah's womb will not be dry and dead, but will be full of life. And then let's look at the laughter element. And that has many elements that we'll see because the word ditzak here um, has three different meanings and they all play out together. And I've color coded them. So the humorous one here, plainly, he laughed. It's as simple as that. There's nothing else going on. And we'll see in the parallel in the next chapter, Sarah laughed to herself, but not completely to herself because Yahweh hears it. And we see this back and forth there. In the scene with Lot and um, and his sons-in-law here, they say he seemed to be jesting, which would also be the form of mocking or playing. Playing here can be playing just like ordinary playing, but playing with um, in the way that mocking is. Um, so here it's also laughter, Sarah um, laughter for the new child, but this could go either way. And that was, we'll see the preposition could be with or at. So it's laugh with as humor, but laugh at would be mocking. And, and the word carries both connotations. Uh, in this one here, uh, I didn't color code this because this is highly ambiguous and can go multiple ways. And the with her son Isaac is in the Septuagint, but not in the Hebrew. So when we get to that, we'll see six different possibilities of what it is that Sarah sees the son of Hagar doing around that verb. 
Uh, then in chapter 26, we see that the king Abimelech of the Philistines sees Isaac Yitzhaking with his wife, and it's interpreted as fondling, and that's how he knows he's not his, her, his sister, but his wife. And so there's certainly a sexual connotation there. Uh, and there's a sexual connotation here, but also a mocking one, when Potiphar's wife calls out to her household about Joseph, see my husband is brought among us a Hebrew, to insult us, or to mock us, to make fun of us, uh, any of those things. Curiously, it's of all these times, it's only two other times elsewhere in the entire Hebrew Bible. One in uh, in the uh, golden calf story in Exodus 36, when all the people rose up to revel. And that could be imply sexual orgy or simply play, but most scholars take that as some kind of sexual orgy. And then with Samson here, um, here it says playing, playing for them. Um, so uh, throughout we hear these different nuances, and we'll hear it's playing the laughter, but we'll explore that more as we go to see uh, uh, the nuances of that, especially as they name their child Itzhak, Itzhak laughter. Um, so Abraham laughed and said to himself, or literally to his heart, as if God couldn't hear it. Um, so that's all that's happening here. And he asked this as a question seemingly to himself, um, as Wenham suggests, combines two different constructions. Probably the confused syntax reflects Abraham's inner confusion. Um, and that may well be. Um, and notice that he asks about both of them. Can a child be born to a man as if a child was born to a man at all? Um, and can Sarah, who is 90, bear a child? And that's partly to get the, the word for bear here repeated. But plainly, the man isn't the one to bear, although it'll be associated with Ishmael, as we'll see in just a minute. And so after the rhetorical uh, questions, which seem to both imply the impossibility of a, a positive answer, Abraham then suggests an alternative. And this is one of the first times we'll see that. Um, we saw in chapter 15, he, he complained about Eleazar was the only one who would inherit, um, but he didn't exactly distrust. In fact, it was counted as trust in 15.6 in the verse that Paul uses to such force in uh, Galatians and became such a linchpin of the Reformation. But we don't need to get into all that business here. So Abraham says now out loud to God, although whatever out loud to God means as opposed to saying to his heart, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight, literally in your face, uh, but can also mean by your favor. Um, and then we have to pause and realize Ishmael is 13 years old. And not only that, Hagar is still around. And they've been living with Hagar all this time. Um, some 14 years at least from the time she um, they waited to conceive to the time that she was pregnant, and now Ishmael is 13 years old. So how has that been? What's it been like for them to live with Ishmael and Hagar? We know nothing about Ishmael's childhood, although in chapter 21 we'll get one glimpse in, from the chart that I just showed you about the ambiguity of seeing Ishmael um, Yitzhaking. Um, so God's response is very strong. The word no here, aval, is only one other time in Genesis, but as Wenham notes, it's a very strong rebuke here. Um, and these little verses form a little chiasm as well. The Ishmael parts, I won't lay it out separately, but you can just see it there with Ishmael at the center. Um, and this will be the contrast between the Isaac in the covenant, but also Ishmael being blessed. And we'll note that Ishmael is named as being blessed, but Isaac is not. And it's not that Isaac isn't being promised uh, a plentiful and bountiful future, but the word blessing isn't used there. So no, but your woman, Sarah, shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Laughter. Um, and here it is. Um, um, notice I didn't highlight that as laughter, um, but it could be, the original meaning could be Yitzhak El, God laughs as a sign of joy and prosperity, or as the expression of the father's joy, or as Western, it's a combination of all these things. Um, and that's just sort of giving up and interpreting, I would suggest. We'll see more as we go. Using this language we already saw, I will establish or my, uh, build up or stand up my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant. Uh, repeating what we heard in 17.7 and 13. So now it's been this refrain uh, we've seen all the way through here, everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So that would already be implied, of course, from Abraham, since Isaac is going to be plainly one of the seed after uh, Abraham. Um, but here it is being affirmed that Isaac is going to be the one, not Ishmael. But as for Ishmael, um, and there's a wordplay here, like Isaac's with laughter, it's a wordplay on listening. I have heard you. 
And so um, the Shema here is the, is the primal prayer for Jews to this day, uh, hear, O Israel. So you can hear Shema, Ishmael um, in there is a word play, even though Ish means man. And so it's a, it's a play of a couple lever, levels there. So as for Ishmael, I have heard you, which is say Abraham, I will bless him and make him fruitful. As some was always leaving out the Hebrew Hannah, behold, emphasizing that. Yeah, they pause point that I will bless him and I will make him fruitful and exceedingly uh, numerous, um, greatly as yes, greatly numerous. One of those um, doubling ones echoing exactly what it said about Abraham earlier, but he shall be the father of 12 princes. Notice the difference. It said that kings would come from Abram, now Abraham and Sarah, but it didn't say they would be the father of them. It just said they would come from them. But here specifically from Ishmael, it says 12 uh, a princes, and the word is Nesaim here, which can mean prince, but it can also mean any kind of leader. And it will be explicitly fulfilled in chapter 25. Let's look at that briefly here. As we'll see, these are the descendants of Ishmael, and they're all named um, and described exactly here as 12 tribes, uh, 12 princes according to their tri tribes. So explicitly fulfilled there that um, God will make sure that Ishmael is also blessed, but not in this particular covenant. And will make him a great nation. Also give um, and Natan all these times all the way through. So to the extent that Ishmael becomes the, the centerpiece for Muslims and becomes uh, the focal point of their covenant and Christian Islamic dialogue is off or failure of dialogue over the centuries is often May there be a sharp contrast between Isaac and Ishmael, and there, therefore between Christianity and Islam. There's no basis for it from this text whatsoever, or from Genesis at all. Um, Ishmael is never treated negatively. He's just not simply part of this particular lineage. Um, and he's promised, you know, much bounty and blessing as well. But emphasizing, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, um, forming another little chiasm with the earlier example of it, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And now there's the first time we're hearing that, the specification that it won't just happen someday, maybe, I promise, it really will, but next year, uh, which is to say that she will become pregnant imminently. Um, if he's coming back at this season, although the language for season isn't exactly here, um, but it's certainly specifying next year. Um, so now a clock is ticking as opposed to all the 25 years that have gone by since they got to the land and since God promised in chapter 12 that they'd be a blessing if they listened to Yahweh and followed on this path. Now it's about to happen. And so with that, uh, we hear from the narrator that uh, God had finished talking with him. God went up from Abraham. Uh, the first time we're hearing some kind of sense of description of ascending, uh, we recognize that throughout this scene, we've not known what their relationship is. As I was searching for art, um, I could not find any art of the scene because what exactly would an artist show? There are endless artistic uh, images of the Akita, the binding of Isaac, as well as in chapter 18 of Abraham meeting the angels or the messenger men beginning of 18, but I could not find any of this because perhaps it's all just in Abraham's head. Now, perhaps there's nothing to show. It's just like in chapter 12, Abraham having this experience of the God who called him, talking to him. Although, um, as we see throughout, it's been Elohim, and we won't take that as a separate God over against the source uh, critics that would separate those out. Um, so all that's left now is for it to be carried out, and that's part of Abraham's fulfillment, that if he does what he's required to do, he will trust that God will do what God will require to do, and that's what we'll see in the very next chapter. We'll continue there next time. See you then. Bye-bye.